All right, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, how are we going? So what I want to do today is talk you through what is this new uh, approach that uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand is taking to drive uh, how we do things, which is insights that drive action that drive impact. And it all comes back to the strategy. So a lot of work has gone, gone on in the last year or so to actually redevelop the strategy for Beef and Lamb New Zealand, starting with profitable farmers, uh, thriving farming communities valued by all New Zealanders. That's the vision. The next section, the purpose, that's really where, 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 I'm, where I'm focusing today, is the insights and actions that drive tangible impacts for farmers. And then you've got the priorities, which are the actual areas of focus. And really what I want to explain is how we're working in that purpose area to make sure that what we're doing is making a difference. So how do you decide what to do? That's really the, one of the critical challenges. Um, and where we started is at, at the core of everything, you know, by farmers for farmers. So we start by looking at the horizon and looking at all the things that are of importance to farmers. But as you've just seen in the, in the red meat story, we also need to understand what's happening with our consumers, the people who, who actually buy our products. So we need to understand all of that, but that's clearly not enough. We also need to understand what's happening on our farms in terms of our production systems, the changes in the way in which we run things. We need to understand what, and what's happening in science and innovation. We need to understand what's happening in the environment, and we all know that there's an increasing focus on environmental performance. We need to understand what's happening in our supply chains and our partners. We need to understand what's happening in society and politics because that impacts on everything that we do. We need to understand these things, regulations, and how we can ensure that those are, if we're going to have them, that they are the kinds of regulations that actually drive uh, and support our businesses. If we want to get access uh, to our customers, often we have to go through market access rules and, and trade negotiations and those sorts of things. And last but definitely not least, we need to understand what's happening in the market. So this is the model that we're using uh, to understand all of the issues that we might be facing um, in terms of how we might achieve um, our objectives in the strategy. So what are some of the things that we've identified that we need to keep an eye on um, as, as an organisation on your behalf. So looking at, and these, we've organised these under those, those, those four headings in the strategy. So looking at supporting farming excellence, um, the capability of sheep and beef workforce. I won't read all of these, you know, you'll, you'll get the slides afterwards, but you get an idea of the sorts of things that we've identified we need to keep an eye on. The things in bold are the ones that we're focusing on uh, as a focus at the moment. Unlocking market potential. You'll have seen all of the focus we've done around consumer preferences and brands, and also the, you might have seen some of the work we've done around alternative proteins. Enhancing our environmental position. This is white hot at the moment. You'll all be aware of that. Um, a huge amount of pressure with a new government with a very strong focus in this area, and so you'll not be surprised to see that three, out of, three, that three of the five things we're focusing on at the moment are in this area. But there's also this whole issue of how we relate to government and to the public. Um, and th there are a whole lot of things there, but the one that we want to get right right at the beginning is the sector narrative. And part of the Red Meat story is part of that, but it goes wider than that. So we're working on that. So it's all very well to talk about this stuff in theory. Let's talk about it in practice. What have we done so far and where are we going? So the Alternative Proteins Report was a really important piece of work uh, led by various people across the organisation, but largely out of Nick's team, um, and has really driven some of the insights that have driven the, the red meat story you just heard about. And the consumer insights, uh, the, the 85 uh, different pieces of, 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 of discussion that happened around the, around the world. Some other pieces of work that are starting to build up the story around the environment, some piece, a piece of work that was commissioned that helped us to identify the amount of native vegetation on sheep and beef farms. It is substantial. Um, around a quarter of all New Zealand's native vegetation is on our, is on our properties. That's a really important um, custodianship responsibility. We've also done work on calculating the, the greenhouse gas emissions for the sheep and beef farms since 1990, and you'll know, or you ho I hope you know, that there's been a drop overall uh, for the sheep of around... Uh, uh, 19 and for, and for beef around 20. So it's very sim you know it's it's a it's a significant drop. Now, most a lot of that has been because people have left the industry, farms have left the industry, but of course the production levels have stayed up. 
So the efficiency, uh, the amount of emissions per kilo uh, exported had actually gone down significantly. We've also been doing work on the value of hill, of hill country sheep and beef farms. There's quite a lot of chatter around about those, around, around the hill country. And we need to identify the value and some of the issues that we can work on that area. And the last is the capability of sheep and beef, of capability needs of the sheep and beef sector workforce. Um, and we know that this is an area that, 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 that you have all told us uh, that we need to do, do more work on. It's something that we keep hearing is really important, and we also hear we're not quite satisfied with the progress that's being made. So we, we did a review of this area to identify, well, okay, what do we actually need to focus on? You'll hear that word focus quite a lot. Certainly Nick used it a lot. I'm going to be using it a lot in the organisation because you can't do everything. And so what we, the work that we've done is to identify what are the priority capability needs. And I'll be really, really clear, they're the needs that drive the strategy. You know, it's no point in having a strategy if you don't really focus on it. So what have we done? What have we learnt? Well, one of the things we've learnt is we've really had to focus on our owner operators, the people who actually run the, 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 the farms. Most of our farms in the sheep and beef sector are still owner operated. Um, and we know that there are some issues there around the age profile and the issues around succession and environmental management, et cetera. So we've identified what the needs are of those groups. We've also identified the growing roles of farm governors um, and, 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 and what are the different sets of capabilities that they need to, to have, um, particularly connection to the rural communities, uh, and they're also particularly important for Māori agribusiness. There is a growing group of, of farm managers in the sheep and beef sector, um, and we need to understand what, what are their needs in terms of skill, but also in terms of attractability and, 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 and keeping them in the sector. And so issues around pathways to ownership um, and, and issues like, do they actually get the lifestyle they want? Permanent employees. Um, we don't have a huge number of permanent uh, full-time empl uh, permanent employees, but they're obviously critically important. Casual employees are important. Now you'll notice so far a very heavy preponderance on farm. That's no, there's no, uh, there's no, mist uh, there's no surprise about that. That is actually where the biggest need is. There are lots of other people looking after the skill sets of other people off farm but nobody else is looking after the skill needs of people on farm. That's something that this sector, you know, really can, and beef and lamb can only take responsibility for. But there is one group that we really think is important um, off farm, and that is the researchers, scientists, specialists, technical staff, and policy analysts. They need to understand our sector, and we need to do what we can to, to get them to understand uh, what, what our needs are. So those are the six groups that we've identified as being our targets for support in terms of capability development. And it is a relatively narrow group, I'll be clear on that. So in terms of those capability needs, what have we focused on? And again, constantly reminding ourselves and you, we are here to achieve your strategy. So what are the things that are really important? Farm systems, environmental management, Eventually those will probably merge, but at the moment as environmental management is a new, a new area, it probably needs to be kept out separately. People management. Actually, we can't just stop complaining, we have to stop just talking about capability as a problem and actually build it into the solution of how do we support you uh, and, your, and your staff to manage themselves and, and capability development ourselves. Community leadership is critical. If we, want to be, if we want thriving rural farming communities, we're going to have to be leaders in our own communities, and not just within our rural communities, but also reaching out to urban communities. So telling the story about the great things that we're doing is a critical thing. Practical and technical skills. Where are we going for time? It's frozen out on me. Um, ownership and succession planning at both ends, both in terms of of, of, of owner operators, but also can we create some opportunities for, for others. Attraction and retention, and sheep and beef sector knowledge. Now, I'm not going to read through all of this, but this is just to give you an idea of how the depth 
of, of some of the things that we've gone into. We've actually looked into how can we actually provide tools and resources around each of these areas? How can we support uh, both yourselves and others who are working with you to achieve capability improvements in each of these areas? And identified a range of delivery options for, for actually getting that information and knowledge to you um, and to the right to those groups. And you'll see that there's an overlap with other things that we're already doing, like the RMPP action networks, all the stuff that we're talking about um, in our environment strategy around catchments. So we're, co we're connecting up the things that we do um, and, and doing them in a, in a joined up way. And you'll see that there is a, a, a mixture of, of different approaches. We're not, we're not saying that there's only one way to do this. But there are some things that are not on here. Um, scholarships are not. But what we are saying is that we actually do think there are ways of getting connections between people who are doing research that are better than giving them a scholarship. We'd rather give them a research fellowship and say, for example, attach one of them to each of our uh, extension offices and actually have them around the country working with your farms rather than sitting um, back in a, in, a, in a laboratory. Because actually we want to, at the end of the day, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want them to have a connection and knowledge about the sector, not just some abstract research. Now, that's, that's because we're being relatively selfish about how we want to spend your money. So, that's one example of how we're using a really analytical framework and a really focused, focused approach on our strategy to drive um, investment in action. Where are we taking our focus next? Um, so capability is essentially done as a piece of analysis. Um, still a lot of implementation to do. Uh, sector narrative is really important. So giving you guys and, and everybody who works and, is, and, and cares and support about this sector a really clear set of messages that we can take to talk to the community. Uh, the wider New Zealand community. Uh, the red meat story, as I said, is part of that, but we need a, a, a really clear uh, tool to help you do that. The next three are all really about supporting the work that we're about to launch. So the middle of, middle of this month, we'll be launching our environment strategy, which is an absolutely critical part of what we need to do to uh, essentially have the table stakes to be able to, to do things like the red meat story, but also to ensure that some of those regulations we're a little worried about don't come down in ways that we don't want them to. Um, so the first is the greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and the ETS. And you'll, you'll be of no surprise that that's an area of huge focus for us. You know, this government is committed in principle to agriculture uh, being in the uh, emissions trading scheme. We need to make sure that we are well positioned uh, to, to participate in that in a way that ideally advances uh, what we're about uh, rather than hinders us. Water quality and water use is a huge issue. In fact, Karina, you'll be talking a lot more about that later today, specifically. But you know, you're in different catchments, in different regions, uh, some of that is already white hot. Um, we've done a lot of work, in, in the, we're doing work in the Waikato, we've done a lot of work in Southland, um, in other parts of the country. If it's not uh, in your area yet, it's coming. Um, and so we need to be really well prepared. And biodiversity, uh, that's actually, it's one of the pillars of, of our environment strategy. And one of the reasons it's here is because actually I think this is an area where we've got some really good news to tell. In fact, we have some good news to tell in the, in the greenhouse gas area as well, as I mentioned earlier. But biodiversity is somewhere where actually, you know, we can get some wins with the, with the, with, with the urban community um, and, and build some partnerships with them. So I think that's a, that's a really important um, piece of work. And the last one is a little bit more uh, long term, but I think actually quite important because... We don't just want to be dealing with the urgent, we also want to be dealing with the important. Um, and the whole issue of, of genetics uh, and GMOs and the full range of issues uh, that, that are involved in that. Um, and we know that um, there are a wide range of opinions on this stuff, from, from scientific to consumer uh, views and perceptions about whether these are good, good or bad things. And there's also been a huge change in the uh, in the range of scientific capability around genetic modification or, or, or breeding. So you now have a very long continuum from breeding right through to transgenetics. And in the middle you have things like CRISPR, which enable modifications within a, a genotype, or you have epigenetic approaches where you can actually simply 
uh, by applying a, a particular kind of stress or yeast or whatever to actually change the, 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 the expression of an existing gene. So you're not even doing gene editing. Now that's a very long range of options to explore. And we as a sector need to understand what all those options are and what the pros and cons are. So for example, it might be that, that, that overall it might be good for us to be GMO free because that's what the consumer wants. But it, that might, of course, have some costs or, some, or close off some other opportunities. So you need to understand all of the trade-offs, and that's the piece of work that that's about, which I think is very exciting. So that's me. Um, I probably raced through that a bit quickly and because I didn't want to run out of time. Um, but I, I, I really think um, what I'm really excited about, um, I've been in this for three months, um, and I'm really excited about this sector and uh, I've really enjoyed the, the conversations that I've had so far as I've gone around the country talking to people and trying to get an understanding um, of what is it that you see um, as the risks and opportunities for, for, you, for your sector and for your farm uh, and your region and which of these is the greatest potential threat or opportunity. So, and and I'm, I'm equally interested in, in both. I mean, we, 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 there are a lot of threats out there, but there are also huge opportunities. And I think... Uh, the more that we can understand that collectively, the more that we can provide you with information and advice that will help you to run the kinds of businesses you want to. So thank you very much, and I hope that was helpful. Thank, thank you, Lauren. That's why I was just talking dribble until this came anyway. But um, so what was I going to ask? So, so, so my question relates to what we heard from, from Nick BB this morning about our, our, our red meat story and... Um, and at the end, he showed the NZ with the frame and talked about how the stuff we'd have, the imagery would be beautiful and everything was green and big spatial surrounds and no dogs and no fencing and no yards and no forcing. And so I was really excited about the imagery. But on the other hand, I wondered about, um, you know, we do have wet days on farm and we do have mud and um, we do have to use yards and some of those other aspects. So I just wondered, you know, how does that relate to the insights? And if we have um, a brand story like that, you know, there are a whole bunch of other things that happen on farm, and um, and whether any of that sort of fits into into your department. So, I guess um, the point the point that I would make in response to that uh, is we are looking at the whole thing, right? So the brand the brand is about telling a story and a particular story for a particular market. Um, the insights capability is about understanding everything that might be a, a, a threat and an opportunity for the sector. So we're looking at, 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 at things like animal welfare. So that is a major issue in, in the red meat story. And we need to understand what, what might we need to do in terms of in supporting that brand story around animal welfare. And so we will be exploring that in more detail and then sharing that knowledge with farmers because... If, if we want to get the maximum benefit from the brand, we want to maximise that brand value. So does that partially answer the question? So the point, the point I'm trying to make is this is about scanning all of the things that might be a problem for us in the sector and all the opportunities, and then choosing the ones that, that at a particular time that are most salient, the most problematic, and really digging into those and then providing advice both to the organisation but to all of you as our owners what is it that we can do about that? And that's the really critical thing. This is not academic research. This is about working out advice on what to do about things. Uh, and that's, that's a really fundamental uh, question. Uh, <coughs> Jeremy, Andy Russell, from out near Tangi Moana. Yep. Um, the beef, this is a beef and lamb conference, yep. but beef and lamb does get uh, money from, from the dairy sector. <coughs> um, and how, in this day of connectivity, um, if someone's going to research our markets, our, our land market and what have you, New Zealand Inc. is going to be brought up in, with, with the dairy industry and possibly dairy, dirty dairying and, and whatever else, which is a very poor um, label. So, so how does beef and lamb reconcile that with, with our sheep and beef industry? So two things. One, uh, you're right, about 40% of the beef levy comes from the dairy sector. So the dairy sector is part of the sheep and beef sector. It's not separate. So first, first thing first, uh, 
Dairy cows in New Zealand are largely grass-fed, not entirely, but largely. So that's, that is actually still part of, part of the on-brand. And secondly, Dairy NZ and other others in, the, in that industry, in that part of the sector, are doing a huge amount of money to uh, amount of work, sorry, to address those issues that you just identified. And they're, they're under the same pressure environmentally as we are. And in fact, you know, there's a lot of collaboration between us and them on those sorts of issues. So the answer is 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 a, is a bit of both. That yes, we, we we they are part of our sector. They're a significant part of the sector, and we can't sort of just stick them over in a box. But we, we, they also need to work on those issues as as do we. So. It's, it, to, to go back to, to, to uh, uh, sort of sl slightly answer um, the early, uh, William's early, earlier question, um, the, 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 the brand opportunity is significant, but there's a lot of underpinning work that needs to be done to make sure that we live up to the brand. And we're, we're actually quite a long way there, but we're not all the way there. And so some of those things we have to, have, we have to work on if we want to get the maximum value out of that brand opportunity. Um, and frankly, at the end of the day, that's not just nice to say words, that's actually price increases that flow back to farms. So, you know, th and there'll probably be a cost attached to that. So, you know, you don't get stuff for free. So it's working out the cost benefit analysis, and that's another piece of work I've been asked to do, is identify cost benefit tools and cost benefit analysis. But yeah, it's, it's you know, I think the, the, the way I'd say is we, we're a long way along the journey to the maximum value or the optimal value for the, for the um, red meat story, but we're not all the way there. Okay. Um, Jeremy, I've got a question, and uh, usually when I get a microphone in my hand, this is a cue for my <laughs> karaoke special, but I'm going to leave that one behind at the minute. Um, it's a sure number. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I believe. When, when a farmer from a hill country farm says to me... Uh, What's in it for me? How do I answer that question? So what's in, what's in this for, for farmers for, for is better information about the problems and challenges that you might be facing on your farm and how to deal with them. It's that simple. And the second part of the question is how do you see the information best being conveyed to those farmers who never attend workshops, never attend field days or events like this, who actually, to be honest, don't know what they don't know um, but are... Uh, are actually thirsty for knowledge, but won't come out to the field days. So I think one of the things that, that we, we, we know, but we, we don't keep, we keep never come, not enough coming back to is the by farmers, for farmers. We know that the, the people who farmers listen to, and those farmers will only ever listen to another farmer. They won't listen to me. So the thing that we need to do is give you guys the tools and support to, to talk to people in your regions. And one of the things that, uh, that, that Richard Wakelin is now, the new GM Innovation is doing, is looking, and his team are looking at a, a new model for extension. And, and, and we need to really be serious about that. It has to not just be the stuff we've always done. Because we're reaching a certain number of people, but we're not reaching all of the people. And if we don't reach all those people, we won't achieve the brand um, promise that we're setting out. So this is not just a nice to have, this is something we absolutely have to do. Uh, Paul Crick, Eastern North Island Farmer Council. Um, really interesting, Jeremy. The, the question I've got, it's sort of a bit of an amalgamation of some of the other stuff that's been answered, but what I'm really interested in is that we've got, you've got the brand opportunity that, which has been talked about, you've got the insights that you're generating, which is some really good information, uh, particularly around people capability, and I guess the future farmers. So how do we, how do we as farmers, A, how do we, what part do we play? But also the flip side of that is how do you, how do you measure or how do you quantify? So you guys are finding out all this really good information, but how do you actually measure that behaviour change on farms? So how do we know? Because if we get this wrong, if we go to market with the brand that we've seen, the launch this morning, and if we don't back that up yep. with our quality assurance, if we, don't, if we pump some antibiotics into something and we just lie on the sheet and say, no, nah, it's free, we cock that up for everyone. So, so how do we, because unless farmers buy into this, all 12,000, 11, 12,000 of us, plus, that, plus the, the, the dairy farmers as well, how do we make sure, how do we get that buy-in? So that's why I think these things all, all have to be working together. So that's why you'll see the, some of the same things appearing in the list of capability needs that we need to, to build into, into what we're doing for the sector, as you'll see in the environment strategy, as you'll see as underpinning the red meat story. So the Farm Assurance Program, which will link with the farm, farm and environment plans, which will link with what catchment groups are doing. All those things will be connected through the regional extension support system that we'll put in place that will include um, supporting these capability needs, which include things like 
uh, farm systems management, environmental management, etc. So I'm not saying I can guarantee it, but I say we're building the best kind of integrated approach to actually cover off all the various things that, that we need to cover off um, to, to work together in one direction so that we can actually achieve what we need to. Cool. Question down here. Uh, Jimmy, so, so, so for a bunch of this stuff, I guess we'll need a whole bunch of numbers. So, so I don't know, do we, where do we get the information or the metrics or all of these things from? Do we, do we have those? Are yep. we mining our databases? Yep. Do we have to commission bits of work to do that we, that we recently have done? I guess also we don't know what we don't know. So, so what is it that we don't know? Or what's the next big thing well, we don't know? And, and, and look, look, t there's, a lot of, there's a lot in that question. Um, first, first um, we do have a lot of numbers. So you'll, 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 you'll probably be aware, and I, I probably shouldn't have skipped over it, um, I have responsibility for the team that, that runs the sheep and beef farm survey, which uh, surveys every year um, 500 sheep and beef farms. It's actually one of the largest and most intensive survey uh, uh, programs in the country. It's been going for nearly 60 years and it collects about 2,000 data points um, across those farms. So we know what's going on on sheep and beef farms, um, and that data is incredibly powerful. I wouldn't say it's been used to the extent that it probably needed to be in the past, and probably the reason is because the questions that, that you needed to ask weren't being asked, and that comes back to your, thing, your second question, how do you know what you don't know? You ask questions, you talk to people. That's why, at the end of this, I put that challenge what is going on on your farm and in your region? Because I'm not going to know what's going on in your region. The only way I'm going to find out about it is either you tell me or you tell your extension manager or your, um, your uh, economic service manager. So we, are, you know, we do have mechanisms for collecting this information. Um, I think we've been very good at collecting quanti quantitative information, numbers. We haven't been quite so good at, at collecting uh, intelligence. As, as of what is going on out there. So that's part of what, what I'm doing with my team is starting to inc increasingly get them to ask more questions about what, people are, what challenges people are facing. The other thing is it's not just going to be on farm because some of these challenges are off farm. They're understanding what it is that consumers think, what it is that the public of New Zealand thinks, what politicians think. Um, that's stuff that actually some of us in Wellington can actually help, uh, help the, the sector with quite a lot. So, and yes, sometimes we will need to commission pieces of research for two reasons. One, we don't know stuff, but sometimes it's important that it's independent because that way you get a bit of credibility. So, for example, the piece of work that was commissioned um, about um, how, many, how much of uh, sheep and beef farms is native land, that was done by some academics at Canterbury University and uh, Auckland University of Technology because A, they're credible and B, they actually happen to know the stuff but they give us that, in, that independence, which is important. Uh, Jeremy, um, getting back to that, that hill country farmer that hasn't yet been reached, hmm. what do you see happening in the next six months that will actually make him or her feel like they have been reached? Uh, like, what are, what, what are we going to see happen? I know that you've only been in this role for three <laughs> months, but... But you know, what, what are they actually going to see happen where, in the next six months? Well, I think there's, 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 there's... How will they feel touched? They'll feel touched. Um, there'll, be a lot, there'll be a lot more uh, about uh, clarity in, uh, in the media about what we're doing as a sector. And I think we'll be stepping up to the plate in terms of both the red meat story and the environment strategy. I think they'll, that will be noticeable. Uh, people will hear more. Um, I saw a, a great story um, uh, written by, by Lindy Nelson about what we've done uh, in Farmers Weekly. So I think that the, the stories will get out there through the channels that, that those farmers read, you know, those kind of newspapers. Uh, they'll also start to see different ways in which we're interacting through things like the Farmers Council Network to actually get the information out. If we get the sector narr narrative out and we start to, to get that information out about how you can tell your story uh, simply, you know, using a phone or just or just just going to talk to your local community, um, but we will also have things like the farm environment plan program that will start to glow out. And when people start to hear from their from their from their processor that they need to have a farm a farm environment plan because they need to be part of the farm assurance program, you know, those sorts of things will start to hit them. So I think there are a variety of different ways that we'll reach them. Any other questions? 
I was actually just thinking about you right then, Matt, because you were actually <laughs> telling the no, you're telling the farm story through through video and your Facebook page. If anyone hasn't had a look at the Spring Valley Facebook page, they wish you could have a look. Awesome, my my, on here this week. <laughs> <laughs> that is a priority this this week. Uh, I was just um, I think uh, part of the red meat story is the farmers or well, the sheep and beef farmers lo has lost his identity in the community. Yep. Um, uh, what role he actually plays in the community. Um, I think the story, you know, that uh, each farm kind of employs 30 people off farm th through truck drivers, through uh, people in the boning room, through to soil scientists and stuff like that. What What is Beef and Lamb doing, apart from the red meat story, uh, to our urban people locally that is going to help re-establish our identity of, of good people in the community yep. and providers? Yep. So that, that's exactly what the sector narrative um, piece of work that I'm talking about is about. It's about being really, really clear what is that story that we can tell, all of us tell, because the, the way these stories work is if we're, lots of people tell them, right? And if it's consistent across a whole lot of people, eventually the message gets through. And whilst we might feel somewhat isolated from the urban community, we're actually not, because lots of us are interact with them all the time. As you say, we're employing all those people. We interact with them. And... Also, if we can get others to talk about what we're doing and, 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 and the great things that we're doing, and we are doing great things, we're just not, we're not set up to tell the stories as well as we'd like to be. So we need to help farmers tell the stories, we need to tell the stories ourselves better, and that is one of the, 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 the key areas of focus for my work, and which then will support the comms and engagement team to take that out. Um, then the regional, regional extension team, farmers councils, there'll be a whole lot of networks that we'll use to, to, to get that information out. Yeah, hi, Andrew Putty from Wairiri. G'day. Um, you, you had up here your 800 farm managers that you are, you've identified as a group. Yep. And the, the farm staffing issues are in there as well. Yes. The recruitment, of the way I saw, I've got the privilege of going around and meeting a lot of farmers right throughout New Zealand, and the recruitment of young people from the training establishment seems to be pretty good, and, and we're getting, especially through Wairiri, some really good people. One thing I've noticed in the last couple of years that I think really needs to be looked at and looked at very seriously, we've got very experienced farm managers that may have done four or five years managing. They just walk away. They've had enough. Yep. The pressure to perform, yep. the, the, the demand on their family life, the, the anxiety and depression issues I see are quite frightening. And it's an indictment on our industry that we've got employees going that way. It needs to be looked at and it needs to be followed up in that path, I believe. Um, I would endorse what you're saying because I think um, what we've identified is actually m the biggest challenges we face uh, in, in capability in the sector are not actually t fundamentally about skill. They're actually about the, the environment in which people are both working and living. So the community they're living in and whether the community provides the support that they need and whether the actual workplace they, that they're working in provides them the support and advancement opportunities that they need. And, and, and that seems to be, as you, you're just saying, seems to be one of the big challenges that we need to get around. So we need to provide better support around how the, the employment environment works. And we also need a campaign for thriving rural communities because um, you could be the best farm manager in the country and you, you've got all the right skills, but you rock up to a community where there's no rugby club, no internet connection of any use, uh, and no, no, no decent housing, what are you going to do? You're not going to live there. So th those, those are real challenges, and we can't just push them to a side, because if we want those kind of people, we're going to have to work to improve our communities so that they can actually, so they'll stay with us. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the statement I've heard on several occasions is that they reached what they thought was going to be their pinnacle, and they found that there were alternatives out there that were yep. far nicer. That's right. And it, there are two things here, this, 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 this idea about a real farming story. Um, there are a lot of people who think they might like farming, but don't actually don't. And there are probably people out there who don't realise that they would like farming who, who would. And we need to actually probably be a little bit, this is a bit more, bit more your story about mud. Um, we need to be honest about that. You know, this is an outdoor, largely self-contained role where you get to largely within a framework, you have a lot of autonomy. People who work on farms have a lot of autonomy. Most people who work don't, and they sit in offices, 
Now, a lot of people like that, but there's quite a few people who don't like that kind of environment and would happily work in this kind of environment. So we need to reach those people and stop trying to soft pedal, in my opinion, and the research suggests that it's right, stop trying to soft pedal what the industry is and be really honest about it. Okay, thanks. Um, and Andrew, you raised a really good point. I just wanted to take the chance to, to tell everybody that the farmer councils, all the regions in New Zealand, have actually put mental health issues in yeah. supporting thriving farming yeah. communities right up the top on their, uh, their plans. Uh, now, we've got time just for one more question, and I did see one around here. No, it's disappeared. Just to carry on from Andrew, I think um, our industry, if you look at it as a ladder of the people entering at the bottom, being able to see the top has probably, you, step, you take a couple of steps up on that ladder, all of yep. a sudden there's a couple of runs mi missing. Yep. And I think that's where the deer industry is probably people being able to progress up the chain. Uh, what, what else is Beef and Lamb doing to secure more runs on our ladder through um, right from the entry point um, to equity partnerships to land ownership. Yes, yeah, so that's that's one of the things in there. So the whole idea about pathways to farm ownership, or, or farm management and ownership. I mean, I guess they're, they're the two 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 um, ladders that you might want to be talking about. Um, we haven't done it yet, but I think that's something we need to do. Hi, um, Melanie Shepherd from the Red Meat Profit Partnership. Just in uh, answer to the previous question, beef and lamb's a critical partner to one of the 10 for RMPP, and uh, actually it's been a personal project of mine for three years around this ownership and succession space, and we've got a lot of resources that have been created uh, working with farmers and farm managers and staff to better support that whole transition uh, and succession into farm business um, ownership, whether there's entering into a lease block as a, a starting point, or going in as an equity partner or within a family. So I think just to add to your comment, cool. Jeremy, there's actually a, a heap of new stuff out there and I want to back up Andrew. Um, my best friend, she's a farm manager on a farm, finishing farm in, in Pemberley. The stress I see her go through in the isolation because of the loss of autonomy, the daily reporting she now has to do, um, it's huge. And I, I do commend Beef and Lamb for putting capability and support up there. And, and I just want to know the how, like what are we actually going to do about it? For a very insightful presentation. Thank you.